Well, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, so as mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, the NRX project, which is built on top of AMD's Secure Encrypted Virtualization, or SEV, technology. Uh, so I'm going to kick things off. I'm going to give a bit of background on uh, what SEV is and some of its capabilities around uh, lifecycle flows, including attestation. And then I'm going to hand things over to Nathaniel, and he's going to talk more about NRX specifically and how they're utilizing those capabilities. So one of the things that we've been doing at AMD, uh, which you may have heard me talk about it at previous conferences, is that we've began building a hardware AES-128 engine into our memory controllers. And this is present on all of our Zen-based processors for the last couple of years. And this encryption engine is capable of uh, transparently encrypting and decrypting DRAM traffic as it leaves the boundary of the SOC. And we have two different features that utilize this encryption engine. We have, we call our secure memory encryption, or SME feature. Uh, this has a single key that's generated randomly at boot time, and this can be used to encrypt some or all of the physical memory, uh, primarily to protect against things like cold boot attacks. Uh, this is a feature that can be enabled in BIOS, uh, or there's a Linux kernel command line parameter as well. The second feature, which is the one we're going to be focusing on today, is Secure Encrypted Virtualization, or SEV. This is the feature that uses multiple encryption keys and assigns one key for each virtual machine in order to cryptographically isolate their memory both from each other as well as from the hypervisor. In the case of both of these features, the software on the CPUs is not aware of the actual encryption keys. The keys are generated randomly, and they're held in special hardware registers, and they're maintained by what we call the AMD Secure Processor, uh, or you sometimes hear referred to as the, the PSP, the Platform Security Processor. The AMD Secure Processor is a dedicated hardware subsystem that exists in the SOC. Uh, it is anchored by an ARM A5 core. It has some dedicated hardware resources like a private SRAM, some crypto capabilities. And it is responsible for managing encryption keys and performing uh, various lifecycle tasks related to virtual machines. So in a typical configuration, we, we have the AMD secure processor forming the root of trust, and it exposes an API which is publicly documented, and that contains functions related to VM startup, uh, VM migration, attestation, and so on. Those functions are called by the hypervisor. The hypervisor is responsible for uh, performing this interaction, for allocating system resources such as memory and, and uh, physical CPUs, and of course, uh, scheduling the virtual machines to run. The guest operating system inside of the virtual machine is a trusted part of this architecture, and it is responsible for dividing its memory between its private memory, which is encrypted with its own key, and its shared memory, which is visible to the hypervisor. So in a typical SEV system, the vast majority of the guest memory is encrypted, thus protecting the contents uh, of the data that's being actively worked on, except for a few pages like the software IOTLB that are used for DMA operations to the, the hypervisor and other outside entities. The applications that exist within the virtual machine are uh, not modified at all. And that's one of the, the benefits of this architecture, is that the enlightenment happens at the operating system level. And I should say that this is sort of the standard virtual machine model. It's not the only model, as we'll, we'll talk about here as well. In a typical setup, uh, we have support for this with KVM and QMU. Uh, the support is upstream. We have a GitHub page on our website that has instructions for all the major Linux distros now. So if you are interested in kind of setting up a VM with this enabled, uh, we do have instructions on, on how to do that. I should mention that the, this technology first came out a couple years ago with our uh, first generation Epic processors. Uh, only our server processors support this multiple key encryption mode. The single key mode is supported by 
uh, all, of our, all of our products. The first generation processors only support a maximum of 15 keys, so you can only have 15 different virtual machines running at the same time. Uh, we recently, about two weeks ago, released our second generation server processors. Those support up to 509 keys, so you can have substantially more guests running at the same time. So the SEV feature protects the memory of the guest, but there are, there are other things as well. One of the big ones is the register state of the virtual machine. And we created a second optional feature called SEVES, or SEV with encrypted state, that is designed to protect the register state of the virtual machine across world switches. And in particular, this involves hardware changes such that all of the register state of the guest is swapped as one atomic operation, uh, whereas previously this took a number of, of instructions in x86. All of that register state is protected uh, using the, the guest's encryption key. And because of that, there is special flows that have to happen whenever there is any kind of uh, virtualization support that's required around things like MMIO or instruction emulation. And so there is a new exception that occurs that whenever the guest does something like a MSR access that requires hypervisor support, there's actually now an exception that's thrown inside the guest and a handler is invoked which communicates with the hypervisor in order to resolve the situation. Uh, this protocol uses something we call a guest hypervisor communication block, or GHCB, uh, which is an unencrypted page. And the idea is that the guest chooses what register state it wants to expose, as opposed to letting the hypervisor just see absolutely everything inside the guest. Uh, the protocol for this is documented publicly, again, on our, on our webpage. And uh, this feature is, is newer as far as open source support goes. We do have patches on our GitHub that support this today, which you're welcome to try out. Uh, they haven't gone upstream yet, but, but we're expecting to do that relatively soon. So combined SEV and SVES, they don't protect against all possible attacks on a VM, but they do reduce the attack surface substantially. Both of these features can protect the memory of the virtual machine against things like a scrape attack, like uh, someone with root access running DD on the process. Uh, they can also protect against things like uh, some VM escapes or side channel vulnerabilities that result in reading memory as the hypervisor. Uh, because the hardware is aware of what mode it's operating in, it ensures that the hypervisor is only able to see the ciphertext of the virtual machine. Similarly, we have DMA protection that if you plug in a de device, devices are not allowed to access memory using the guest encryption keys, and so therefore they can only see the ciphertext as well. The VM register state, as I mentioned, that was added in the SVES feature. That's really the, the primary difference. Both of the features can protect against uh, what we call offline physical attacks, so things like cold boot attacks, again, because that memory is encrypted and the encryption key is stored inside the SOC hardware. It's not stored anywhere on the DRAM chip itself. And we can also protect against certain kinds of uh, boot time attacks, such as an integrity attack on the initial image of the VM as it's starting up. Uh, or what's listed here is a counterfeit machine attack. So that could mean either attempting to start up the virtual machine on hardware that isn't real, or just not turning on the security features that the customer is expecting. And both of these features are handled through the attestation flow, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second. So before I get into the attestation flow, let me just walk through how a typical VM is started. So when the hypervisor wants to run one of these SCV VMs, it will first ask the secure processor to generate an encryption key. This is a random key, and assign it a specific slot in the key table in the memory controller. After that, the hypervisor will place the initial image of the guest unencrypted 
into memory. Uh, this initial image is assumed to be something like a guest BIOS. Again, this is speaking in the context of a traditional virtual machine. It's not the only way this can be done. Uh, but so this initial image is not expected to contain any secrets. And the hypervisor then calls the secure processor, asking it to encrypt this image with the VM's encryption key. And as it does this, it is computing a cryptographic measurement of the contents that it is encrypting. At the end of this, the hypervisor closes the context, and the secure processor generates an integrity hash over what it has measured. And this is at the time that the attestation protocol happens. This allows the owner of the guest, which would be, say, the cloud customer in a typical cloud computing scenario, to determine if they like the way that the VM was started. And if so, then they have the ability to inject some sort of secret material. So diving into that a little bit further, this slide makes things look more complicated than they really are. Essentially what happens is in order to support this attestation and secret injection protocol, there is a Diffie-Hellman exchange that occurs between the AMD secure processor running on the physical box and the guest owner, which again would be like you if you're the cloud customer. And this is done using what we call the platform Diffie-Hellman key. This key is signed by a number of other keys. To simplify things, there's really two chains of trust here that's going on. The first one traces back to what's called the OCA, the Owner Certificate Authority. And this is something that the owner of the box, like the cloud provider, can install in order to basically demonstrate ownership of the platform. And so this can assure you that your VM is started up in the data center you expect. This is primarily used for enforcing things like migration policies and whatnot. It's an optional feature. The second chain of trust goes back to AMD. And this proves that you're running on authentic AMD hardware. And this goes through fuses that uh, every part we manufacture has a unique key, what we call a chip endorsement key. And that key is eventually signed by an AMD root key. And if you go on our website again, we have an interface where you can get the certificate chain for any uh, AMD EPIC part. You just you put in a, a unique identifier of the part, you get the certificate chain, and we also have our public key available on the website, which allows you to verify this entire chain when this Diffie-Hellman exchange occurs. So putting this all together, when the VM starts up, the hypervisor will start off by getting this PDH, the platform Diffie-Hellman key, from the security processor. And it will also gather the various certificates that, again, we've posted on our website and send them to the guest owner. And the guest owner will verify that the certificate chain is correct. And if everything checks out, then they will generate their own Diffie-Hellman key, send that back to the system. And this is then provided to the secure processor during the launch process. The hypervisor will continue by installing the initial pages for the VM and encrypting and measuring them. And when it's finished, it gets what we call this launch measurement from the AMD secure processor. And this measurement is an HMAC that contains the measurement of the pages, as well as uh, information about the policy of how the guest was started up, like if it had debug enabled or not, some other version information. And this gets sent over to the guest owner. And I should mention there are some nonces in here to ensure freshness, which I've kind of glossed over. Uh, but there's details in the spec. The guest owner verifies that this HMAC is correct, that it, it contains the expected information. And if so, then they can turn around and encrypt a secret. And this secret could be something like a disk decryption key to allow the VM to continue booting. Uh, it could be some other sort of root key for the system. That is then sent over this encrypted Diffie-Hellman channel to the, the hypervisor, it passes that in turn to the secure processor, which is able to decrypt it and then inject it into the initial image of the VM. And at that point, the VM can then be run 
And if this whole process occurs successfully, somewhere in its encrypted memory image at a presumably well-known location, it would be able to find the secret which it, which it can then use to continue the process. If the attestation process fails for some reason, or if the hypervisor just chooses not to even do it, then presumably the secret would not exist and you would not be able to continue the boot. So this is the, the basics of SCV and the basics of the attestation flow. And at this point, I'm gonna hand things over to Nathaniel and he's gonna talk about how this is used with NARCs and the cool things that that can do. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, I'm gonna switch some slides here for a moment, so. Okay, so uh, I'm Nathaniel McCullum from Red Hat, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the NARCS project. And I'm going to go pretty quickly through these slides. We have a lot of material to cover, uh, and, uh, but I want to make sure we get it all in. So uh, the most important thing, of course, is our website, uh, which is very small, apparently, on the screen. That should be a little better. Uh, NARCS.io, so E-N-A-R-X.io. So let's quickly outline the problem scape at a very high level. Um, we all have need for uh, privacy and integrity in the cloud. Uh, this is just a, a small set of examples. Um, if you have data, if you have algorithms, that qualifies you uh, for privacy in the cloud. Um, but the difficulty with this, of course, is that uh, we have a fairly complex uh, stack. This is your sort of traditional virtualization stack, uh, where you have everything from the CPU at the bottom up through uh, BIOS, firmware, hypervisor, bootloader, kernel, user space, middleware, and application. And in order to have a trusted application, uh, at least currently as we deploy software, uh, we actually have to trust the entirety of this stack. Uh, but unfortunately, you don't have control over all of the stack. Typically, you're only the person writing the application at the top. And uh, the different colors here uh, highlight where, uh, at least traditionally, uh, different trust relationships uh, were, came from. So in virtualization, right, you could buy an operating system like RHEL. Uh, you, could, you could have support for it. And that would give you at least one single point of trust for, the, for a large portion of the stack. Um, but this gets much worse in, when we do containers uh, because there's a lot more layers. They come from a lot, a lot more different places. Uh, so the interactions are pretty bad. And there's a uh, fantastic XKCD uh, comic, uh, which basically gives us the entire stack and shows the compromises uh, pretty much at every layer in the stack. Right, so um, one way we could try to do this is we could try to uh, measure the entirety of the stack, but that becomes somewhat fragile because the pieces are changing out all the time. Uh, so uh, what we want to do is we want to use uh, these trusted execution environments uh, as a way to, in fact, remove a bunch of the stack so that we just don't have to trust it at all. We want to basically just trust the CPU at the bottom, uh, middleware including NRCs, uh, anything you, uh, that would include NRCs, and then anything you use in your application, uh, and then finally the application itself. So let's, let's just look at trusted execution environments at a very high level. Um, the basic thing that trusted execution environments provide is this. Uh, there's a host and there's a tenant. The host is going to attest to the tenant, so it's going to give it some kind of uh, um, cryptographic uh, attestation, which typically includes things like some sort of Diffie-Hellman uh, public key so that you can set up a session key with the actual hardware that's, that's being uh, done there. Um, this also typically includes a hardware root of trust, uh, so, or this could be more than one. Uh, in, the, in the example of SEV, you have two. You have one for the platform owner and one for, uh, for AMD itself. Uh, and then finally, you have a trusted uh, execution environment measurement, and this pr proves cryptographically to the tenant that the environment they're about to inject code and data into is, in fact, uh, not compromised. It's, it's an okay state. Um, then, once the tenant is uh, assured of this through attestation, the tenant can then deliver code and data uh, over an encrypted channel into the trusted environment, and they get things like memory encryption and integrity protection and their own independent hardware uh, random number generator, uh, et cetera. 
So in the industry right now, we are seeing uh, a development of basically two different approaches for how to do trusted execution. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the process-based model. And this is basically where you draw a line right down through the middle of a process. And there's a secure portion of the process and an unsecure portion of the process. And uh, the two major public examples of this are Intel SGX and RISC-V's Sanctum. Um, these uh, have several problems, uh, at least from the perspective of being able to develop on them today. First is Intel SGX is not upstream, nor is it even stable yet uh, in terms of the patches that are going upstream. So you really can't develop on it today, um, at least not in any uh, way that scales. Uh, RISC-V Sanctum, we of course don't have any hardware for that yet, so that sort of doesn't work. On the right-hand side, we have the VM-based model. And this uh, works by, instead of having the uh, security boundary uh, going down through the middle of the process, uh, it happens at the virtual machine boundary. So it's an already existing boundary that we know, we, we trust, we've deployed it very widely. Uh, everyone knows how it works. Uh, and basically, we're just going to incre uh, increase the security of that layer by uh, adding things like encryption and attestation and so on. And there are uh, three uh, public models for this. Uh, AMD SEV, as my esteemed colleague, has already given us a demonstration. Um, IBM PEF, I believe it was last year at uh, Security Summit. Uh, Gurney from IBM uh, gave a, a talk about what they're doing with PEF. The hardware for that's not released yet, so uh, that's also not available to develop on today. Uh, Intel also has a technology called MKTME. Uh, which is currently problematic because it has no attestation. However, they've filed a patent uh, for adding attestation to MKTME. So uh, you can probably guess what's coming next. Um, but there's two things I needed to uh, highlight as not a TEE, uh, and these are Trust Zone and TPM. Uh, Trust Zone is not a TEE because it's really more of a set of utilities to build a TEE, and it also has very significant uh, hardware constraints, and uh, the, the problem of key management is not really solved by Trust Zone, um, so we are excluding it for our purposes. It can't really scale. Uh, the other thing is a TPM. Uh, we all like TPMs. They're, everyone has them in their laptops. Um, but it is just simply not a trusted execution environment. So we've got a lot of models here. Um, and uh, it's probably no surprise why we started with AMD SEV. Uh, it's the first one for which we have both hardware available and full, uh, fully upstream support in the Linux kernel. Um, however, uh, we, we fundamentally have this problem, right? We have a bunch of these technologies that are coming out. Uh, they all provide very vastly different ways to approach the technology. And it's really not clear what developers are supposed to do in order to embrace uh, this technology. So this is why I want to introduce the NRX project. Um, the goal of the NRX project is precisely to make it so that you don't have to worry about these technologies. Um, but even further, we want you to not write your application to any technology, including NRX. Okay? Well, NRX is not an application platform, as you'll see in a minute, um, because what we do uh, is basically on the bottom, we have the process-based keeps on the left side. Keeps are what we call our trusted execution environments. Um, so process-based keep, uh, this includes SGX and Sanctum. We have VM-based keeps on the right-hand side. And NRX is, is planning to work in both of those cases. And basically what we do is we put a WebAssembly JIT as the very first thing that happens uh, inside these ex trusted execution environments. On top of that, uh, we use the WebAssembly system interface, which is uh, not yet finalized, but is an ongoing W3 st W3C standard. On top of this, you can build lang language bindings like libc, and then you just write your application and deploy it. So um, the important bit here is we're implementing standards here. There's not magical NRX stuff that you need to do to your application. You take an application, you compile it in a certain way, and NRX takes it from there. So uh, for example, here is a. Uh, Here's the deployment model. You'll notice that I've put at the top here, NRX is not a development framework. It is a deployment framework. 
So uh, the first thing you do, of course, when you're writing an application is you choose your language and tools. You don't really have to think about NRCs at this stage. You just develop your application, and then when you're done, you compile it to WebAssembly using the standards that are already available. Then at the time in which you want to deploy that application, that's when NRCs get inv gets involved. You take the application, you pass it to NRCs, uh, you choose a host, and you give it the instance configuration, uh, and then NRCs will take the responsibility to deploy that into a secure environment on your behalf. Um, this does have very significant benefits because since we're using WebAssembly here, you can deploy on uh, the same binary on any of the environments, right? So if, imagine if you get a vulnerability uh, in one implementation, you just change your deployment configuration and ship it, shift it immediately to something else. You don't change the binary. You just keep running with the same binary just deployed to a different host. So NRCs is also going to insist on best practices, which will be on by default and will be very hard and we will yell at you loudly if you try to turn them off. Um, this includes things like, we do not allow plain text networking. Shock. Okay, so you can't really do plain text network networking if you don't want your traffic to be observed, so we enforce uh, TLS. Uh, we have a project called Cypherpipe for this. Um, it's in the process of being slightly re rewritten, so uh, we actually have two projects, one called TLS SOC and one called Cypherpipe, uh, but you can see this at our GitHub. And uh, also we plan for no plain, plain text persisted data, so whenever you write data, you just get block encryption uh, from the host side, and from the guest side, you see files. Uh, we will also insist on an independent keep random number generator, and we will review all APIs that are available to the hosts to make sure that they don't leak data. This, by the way, is why you really can't put containers uh, into these kinds of environments, because containers can just call any syscall they want, which means you're basically carrying a pot of soup to the dinner table in a colander. So we're gonna give you a demo. As I said, NRCs is not fully production ready, but we do have some portions of it working. Uh, what you're about to see is you're gonna see a client uh, who is going to, uh, who's gonna be the tenant, and they're gonna deploy some code to run in a server. The, uh, on the server side, we have uh, AMD hardware uh, with AMD firmware, and we're, gonna, we're going to, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do the attestation handshake. Uh, this is what's going to give us the cryptographic validation that we're talking to real AMD hardware here. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to use the session key that's derived from that attestation in order to deliver code and data into the secure VM, and then we're gonna execute it. So. So keep in mind while we're doing this that what's important here is not what we are doing, but how we are doing it. We're gonna take two numbers, three and four, and we're gonna add them together, and the output uh, is seven, which I believe, uh, it's, it's cut off the screen, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, you can, you can see it there in the second time, apparently. Um, so, so it does output the correct number. I think we all agree three plus four is seven. Um, but again, the most important thing here is, is what's being done. Notice that we ran the command twice, that, that we will uh, talk about that in just a second. Uh, but I wanna walk through the steps of what we did. So the first thing we did was the client retrieved a certificate chain from the server. Uh, this is the certificate chain that David just talked about. Then we validated that certificate chain, which means we now know that we are talking to uh, authentic AMD hardware. And uh, we got it, we got, uh, we validated that chain, so we say chain okay. Um, we now can generate session keys and an ex execution policy, which we can deliver uh, to the host to start the VM. Uh, that's validated by the firmware, and the session keys are decrypted by the firmware, so the host can't see them. The next thing we do is we have the server start up a virtual machine. This virtual machine is empty, and by virtual machine here, I don't mean an operating system. I mean, think of like a virtual CPU. That's all we're talking about. There's nothing in this, and by nothing, I mean nothing. No instructions. Um, so we start it up, we measure the empty virtual machine, and we send the measurement back to the client. The client validates the measurement. Okay, yes, this is in fact an empty virtual machine. You haven't injected a boot kit in here that, I, that, I can use to, or that you can use to grab data. So now the client is, is, uh, has fully attested uh, to the uh, server and is ready to deploy code. It has session keys, and so the next thing it does is it encrypts its code and data and sends it directly to the server. This is the point at which I want you to notice that we did this twice. 
This is exactly the same code and exactly the same input, but notice that the ciphertexts are different because we have perfect forward secrecy uh, on the delivery of this code. Uh, so finally, the server receives this encrypted code, hands it over to the firmware. The firmware injects the encrypted code into the VM, launches the VM, our code runs, we get the number seven output, and uh, this takes about 50 milliseconds. I apparently can't exit full screen. So as we said, um, we walked you through exactly what was going to happen, and, and what, that's exactly what we did. We, we did the attestation with the, with the host firmware. We uh, got a session key. We delivered code and data uh, all the way to the secure VM, and we ran the code. And we did so without the host being able to see the code that we injected, the data that we injected, or what was happening uh, while the code was running. So this is what we call the NRX keep, right? This is what we're trying to go for here. We want to be able to deliver encrypted code and data into uh, some sort of a, a trusted execution environment, which we call a keep, and we want to be able to run that. However, we need your help. So we noticed that this, uh, what, what was actually used in this demo uh, was hand-coded assembly. Uh, we don't have WebAssembly running yet. Uh, we do have some, some, uh, some good start on that. Uh, we do have a demos repo that shows some other demos. We have pull requests against the demo repo. Uh, but we would, we would really love to have you participate. This is, of course, open source. Everything that Red Hat does is open source. Uh, it's licensed under Apache 2. Uh, everything we're writing is in Rust. Uh, which gives us the great uh, properties of memory safety that Rust provides. And uh, you can, of course, see our website at nrx.io and github slash nrx. So I think I've left enough time for questions here. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Mike run around with a microphone and ask questions for either myself or for David. If you ask a question, you get a sticker. Oh, do I get a sticker first? Thank you. Um, even if it's a bad question? Hi. Yeah, bad questions are great. I'm Mike Halcrow um, with Google. Um, ha have you, uh, I, was, I was curious about the Azalo project, A-S-Y-L-O. Yes. You know, it's an open source mm -hmm. um, framework and SDK for the development of um, you know, applications for trusted execution environments. And I was wondering if you could compare and contrast um, sure. with, with um, Azalo. In fact, we anticipated this question, and, uh, and we have a slide for it. <laughs> Um, so, currently there are uh, two other major initiatives um, in, the, in, in uh, the open source world right now. Um, the, f the first one uh, is to just write to the hardware-specific SDK. Uh, this is not what you get with the, with the virtual machine-based technology, right? Virtual machine technology, you just get a virtual machine. You don't get an SDK to develop on it. Uh, you only get the SDK in the process model. Um, so you can write directly to the hardware vendor's SDK. Unfortunately, that provides uh, hardware lock-in. You're literally writing your whole application to that SDK. You can only run on that one piece of hardware. And whatever happens if that one piece of hardware that you can only run on because you can only develop to that one piece of hardware it gets a vulnerability, you're stuck, right? So uh, we don't think that's a great option. Uh, option number two uh, is to create some sort of uh, abstraction framework uh, over top of these. And there's been two attempts at this. One is from the Asilo project from, uh, from Google. The other one is the Open Enclave project from Microsoft. And these basically only work with the process-based model. So again, not VMs. They only work with process-based model. And um, it's really great that people are thinking about abstracting this. Um, however, we think it's not great for several reasons. First. We don't want you to develop your application to it. We want you to develop your application like normal and just deploy into these environments, right? We don't want you to change the way you develop your application. Uh, secondly, uh, they provide, uh, both projects only provide abstraction over SGX and Trust Zone. But does anybody remember what I said Trust Zone was not? Trust Zone is not a TEE. It's a framework for building TEEs and has significant problems with scalability. Um, both of these uh, our ARM is very aware of. So because Trust Zone is not a TEE, uh, we end up with an abstraction layer over a single technology, which I don't think provides a lot of value. 
Uh, we end up with implicit hardware lock-in, even though we've written to an abstracted interface. Um, the, other, the other downside, of course, is that these abstraction layers only work on the process-based model, so you don't get to capture any of the work that's being done in the secure VM space, which is precisely why NRX wants to build on both of them. So I hope that answers your question. We'll be very happy to answer further questions in the hallway track. Yeah, but you only get one sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So you're running in a virtual machine. Uh, what's the kernel that's running in the virtual machine? Is it kind of a unikernel, microkernel? Yeah, so we, we actually haven't decided yet. Um, we are um, we're currently investigating an approach which I call the monokernel. Um, and basically what we want to provide is we want to provide an integrated hypervisor, kernel, and application all in one binary. So uh, in terms of where we actually get that kernel code from, that's not been decided. Um, we are probably not going to use Linux for this. Um, because we want to keep everything licensed under Apache 2, uh, and also because we need a significant number of kernel components to be reusable in the process-based model as well. So we need something more modular. Right? We need, a, for example, a file system that can work in both the kernel and in SGX, because we only want to expose block devices. Um, so having a kernel like, like Linux would, could work well in the virtualization case, uh, but then we have to reinvent the entire uh, world for, uh, for or the process-based case. So, uh, so we're looking at various different technologies. We haven't made a decision yet. Uh, I'm having a meeting on Thursday to have a, a deep dive, hammer it out, and try to try to make a decision and move forward. Thanks for the, <coughs> thanks for the presentation. I have two questions. So one of them, uh, so how are you loading this encrypted code and data? Are you injecting the key and then load this code and data from encrypted disk image? Or it, it depends. Uh, so, so no, there's not an encrypted disk image. Um, the, the code is going to be delivered at runtime, and uh, the code, uh, how precisely that workflow works is dependent on the hardware. So the different tech hardware technologies uh, have different approaches for attesting what's in the trusted execution environment. For, for SCV, that, that question was for SCV. So for the demo, we used the launch secret functionality of SEV and launched it directly into an, an empty uh, virtual machine. I believe that functionality is going away at some point, and we're going to get a slightly different functionality. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. There, there might be some changes in the future, but um, yeah, in, in the current technology, is literally the the code bytes are the secret that is injected, and then it's just executed from there. It's not the only way that it could be done, but that's that's what's done today. Yeah, thank you. And another question: So, are you planning to use this Intel SGX Protect Code Launcher? I, I'm uh, sorry, I missed the second um, one. So you mentioned Intel SGX, which is not available yet, but are you planning to, Intel SGX has something called protected code launcher. Um, so I heard something about protected code launcher. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to there, but we do, so we are working on SGX. Um, we actually have a pull request for a demo doing attestation, basically what you already saw, kind of, a little bit less than what you already saw on SEV. Um, so there's a pull request from one of my team members, um, and we're gonna be hopefully merging that this week. Um, so we are looking at other technologies. We have no intention of locking anyone into a technology. The whole point of this architecture is to make it very, very easy to uh, work across a variety of technologies and not have to develop your application to one specific technology. Anyone else? James, how are we doing for time? Is it about time? Ten minutes left. Oh, ten minutes. Come on. Let's I talked very questions. fast. Okay, one over here. So to, to launch this application, we seem to be going through the attestation framework. So how, what's an overhead that happens before you could actually launch and run the... The game? overhead for yeah. the attestation model? Uh, in the case of SEV, uh, we were looking at 50 milliseconds. Um, and uh, that was all local, so there was, no, there was no network. You would need to have some network latency as well. You'd also been probably going to deliver a larger application than that as well. Um, so it, it's really hard to predict, and it, it's going to be basically linear with the size of your application. Uh, we, we would probably implement some sort of a caching framework as well, I would imagine, um, although there's a tension with uh, delivering perfect forward secrecy. 
Hi, uh, this is Anshul from Amazon. Um, for David, so uh, are we not worried about the side channel attacks, uh, including like page page fault based attacks or cache based attacks uh, when you're encrypting the entire VM with SCV, uh, SME? You're asking about uh, like side channel attacks like like prime and probe and and page embasing, right? So those are currently not part of our threat model of SCV, and and they're kind of not part of the the standard x86 threat model either. Like we don't have any way of preventing you from writing code that might be vulnerable to like a prime and probe based attack. Uh, so, right, there's there's nothing in this generation that we provide specifically for that, other than just the guidance that you know please don't write your crypto libraries to use values dependent on secrets and things like that. Uh, but beyond that, we don't have any special capabilities. I, I should also note here that. Um, in the way that NRX is designed, uh, you're going to basically get uh, a block of native code that's all delivered by NRX, and we would hope that to be side channel resistant. And uh, and anything that uh, that has problems, we would want to invest in mitigations. And in fact, I already have an open bug about uh, about developing mitigations for side channels. Uh, they do both have uh, different problems. Um, you know, we can we can detect some of that at compile time based upon your compile time target because you're going to be building uh, NRCs for S SGX or for SEV. Um, S in SGX, CPU ID is actually not an available instruction. Although, if you actually look at the Intel SDK. Uh, they currently proxy to the host to virtualize the CPU ID instruction, which now we're trusting the host again. I don't really know that why that's there, but um, but yeah. So th we're going we're going to have to consider that at some point I exactly how we do that. I don't have a clear answer to. And and I'd say also that if you have particular concerns about particular attacks when you are um, deploying, you say, well, I have concerns about attacks on this platform, so I won't allow deployment on that platform. So yeah. you have that option as a deployment at deployment time. Yeah, a big point of this is, right, you have your application. It's the same binary no matter what platform you're launching it on. And so if you consider a particular platform to be broken, just disable it and launch somewhere else. So I'm a bit curious about why and, and how you feel good about WebAssembly. Uh, given the current state of its... Um... Okay, so let me ask this question. What is the largest decentralized computing network in the world? Anybody want to guess? JavaScript. It's JavaScript by, by many orders of magnitude. Right, um, WebAssembly is. Uh, I, you know, I'm currently participating in the standards for WebAssembly to make sure that we get what we need. Um, but the, I think it is clear that WebAssembly is the only thing that we have to potentially dethrone JavaScript as the largest decentralized computing network in the world. Um, and so I think it's a very good fit. It is also very conveniently the WebAssembly system API. Uh, covers as a system API basically exactly what we can do inside trusted execution environments. So it's a very natural fit in terms of capabilities. Did you have a specific concern? Okay. So, um, Monty Wiseman, GE Research. Um, in the earlier slide, you were eliminating all the middle stuff from your TCB. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to argue there's probably some use cases for having that tested as well? Yes. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so they they protect different sides, uh, right? I understand. Is there, and, and I agree with you, is there any notion of binding the, the thing that attests to that stuff in the middle you crossed out would be, for example, a TPM? It would be really nice to be able to, when I talk to this application, to have some binding between the TPM that's on the platform that has keys for these other things you can test to this middle ground. Is there so, any notion of binding, and maybe this is more toward the question of AMD than you, is there any notion of binding these two sets of attestation keys so that I can answer the question, these two things are on the same physical platform? No, um, and, and intentionally no. Um, attestation of the platform protects the platform deployer. 
ap uh, attestation of the tenant application of the trusted execution environment protects the tenant. Uh, these they, they protect simply different parties. Um, if you want to do uh, you know uh, attestation of the entire stack, there are projects for that like Keylime, right? Um, but there's uh, trying to link them together. Uh, fundamentally undoes the sense of radical portability that we are trying to accomplish, uh, because now you've just tied your application to something very specific that the, uh, that the cloud service provider is giving you, and we want our environment to be homogeneous precisely so that you can move it somewhere else, right? Red Hat is very, very against lock-in, and, and we, we would see that as a, as a very clear opportunity for lock-in. Uh, I'm going to try people who haven't already asked questions. So, gentleman here. Just a quick question. Is there any way that you can detect, say, a hostile hypervisor? Say that you're handling all this stuff going back and forth. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes. I can't, I can't really say more. Yeah. <laughs> Patent time. Um, Um, this, you might have already answered this, but I might have missed it. Um, so where does WebAssembly actually fit into the, the stack here? So like, I understand how the attestation process works. Mm -hmm. and I understand how like, once you've actually um, developed like, a, a sense of trust for your VM, you, yep. you inject so, code. But. Uh, essentially, NRX is going to be the bit that you're going to be attesting, and NRX is going to include a WebAssembly JIT. So once you've attested, now NRX is just waiting for you to deliver WebAssembly code that it will JIT. Okay. okay. And so you will then have encrypted code and data that you deliver to the NRX runtime. NRX runtime will handle that data in a way that's appropriate and will compile, uh, just in time compile, the WebAssembly to the native platform and then execute. I'll hand over to James. I think we're out of time. Sorry. We're very, very happy to, to be around. And Nathaniel's around for the rest of the day. I'm around for the rest of the week. There's David's a boff, right. right, later this year. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a boff. Um, specifically on Open Enclave stuff, Microsoft running, we're happy to be involved in that if Microsoft folks are happy. So. And we have stickers, so you can uh, ask this guy for stickers if you want one. All right, I, think, I think that boff is a separate. Okay, thank, thank you. you.